Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a medical oncologist, and I practice there at Albuquerque, New Mexico. In 2012, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation gave me $19.8 million to see if I could duplicate what I had created in my little practice in New Mexico into other practices in other places in the country to meet the triple aim a better health, better health care, and a lower cost. So I'm a little private practice. What we called the changes we made in my practice was the oncology medical home. And to explain to you what that is, I'm going to tell you a story. And the first part of the story is actually true. <laughs> this is about a patient named Larry. Larry was an 84-year-old retired physics professor. And he had metastatic pancreatic cancer. He knew what his prognosis was, but he wanted a year. And he didn't want to die in a hospital. And to console his buddies in the physics department, when he left to move to New Mexico to live with his family, he told him he wasn't really going to live with his family and die in New Mexico as cancer. He was actually going to run off with a Las Vegas showgirl. <laughs> One morning, Larry woke up, and he was sick, and he was confused. So his family called my office, where the phone was answered on the second ring by a human being who promptly figured out he was sick and transferred that call to one of our triage nurses, who then opened up the pathway for rapid onset confusion, told him to come into the office now, and activated the order set that goes with that pathway. When Larry arrived at the office about half an hour later, he was really sick. He was making no sense, low blood pressure, very sick. And within the next hour and a half, he had fluids and antibiotics and a CAT scan to make sure he didn't have blood clots in his lung. Five hours later, when the hospital finally had a bed available for him, he was pleading with me to please not put him in the hospital because his family was going to take him to Las Vegas that weekend, and he didn't want to miss that trip. So we got the next morning when I saw him in the hospital. His major complaint was that the coffee was terrible, and it is, so I knew his mental status was back to normal. <laughs> So I let him go home and finish his antibiotics in the office. A week later, I saw him in the office for the next cycle of chemotherapy, and he brought me this picture. <laughs> he also sent it to all of his buddies in the physics department. <laughs> there are no quality measures that measure anything we did. Now, suppose that it wasn't my practice, but it was a non-medical home practice. What would have happened? He would have called up. He would have gotten, if this is a medical emergency, hang up and dial 911. So he would have done that. And he would have gone to the understaffed, overworked emergency department, where while he was waiting five hours to be seen by the doctor, the nurse would have checked his hemoglobin A1C, confirmed his code status, queried him about smoking, and gave him yet another Pneumovax, <laughs> thus meeting four quality measures right there. <laughs> and then when he was seen five hours later, he would have been really sick. He would have been so sick that his hospital stay might have been a week. He might have had to go to the ICU. He might have died. But all the quality measures would have been met, except for one. The oncologist would have gotten a black mark for having given him chemotherapy two weeks before death. So which do you think is the better quality of care? So I've learned in years of just being a practicing oncologist that every time I put somebody in the hospital, even if they don't get the bad bugs or the blood clots or other complications, every time they come out, their quality of life is a little bit less. It's just that downward stride. So we created in my practice 
a method to figure out how to keep people out of the hospital. We figured out what are those symptoms that trigger the result, and then we backed up two steps and said, where can we intervene really early so that we can keep people like Larry out of the hospital? And we succeeded in doing this. We are the red boxes. The rest of Albuquerque is the blue boxes. And so we have significantly less amount of time in the hospital for our patients. That's more time they get to spend with the people they love. So we also figured out that that was saving people a lot of money. Now, everybody in oncology is focused on the drugs. You just heard two talks about the drugs. The drugs are wonderful, and they're incredibly expensive, and everybody knows that. But the drugs are 14% of what we spend on treating cancer patients. Hospitalizations are about 54%. I can't control, despite what CMS thinks, the cost of the drugs. What I can control is how aggressively can I manage the complications of cancer and its therapy so that I can keep my patients healthier and happier. So we also learned that by doing this, and this is why CMMI and others were interested, that we could save the system a lot of money. This is one of the practices that was in the Come Home Grant, New England Cancer Specialists. They are a fabulous practice. And they have this thing in Maine called the all-payer database, so that we can compare their costs with the whole rest of the state of Maine. And the different blocks, there are different types of treatment, drugs, laboratory, et cetera. So about $20,000 less per cancer patient treated in a come-home practice. That's pretty good. We estimated that we saved, for the last two years of the grant, about $1.6 million a month for Medicare. And that also means that we saved our patients a lot of money in co-pays and deductibles. So how did we do this? Well, I've talked about the triage pathways. And when I got the money from CMMI, I could use some of that money to hire software engineers to put those triage pathways in electronic form so that as you asked the questions, it prompted the right questions. When you got to the answer, the whole thing vanished and you just sent the patient where they needed to be. And you could activate the orders at that point. And because nobody pays in our fee-for-service world for nurses to be on the phone talking to patients, I could pay with grant money to the seven practices that participated the cost of the salaries of those nurses. Then we learned, then we got rid of that 911 recording. Then we learned also that we really had to educate patients a lot because they're taught to call 911. We had to educate them that we really did want to hear earlier when they had a 99 degree fever, not 102. And what we found at that point was you have to educate them and their caregivers and their best friend and their next door neighbor and everybody multiple times. And guess what? There's no fee for that service either. But we could pay for it with the grant money. And then we had to leave gaps in our schedule and we had to extend the hours we were open so that we would be there when the patients needed us, not when it was convenient for me to be there. And if no one happens to show up, I still have to pay the light bill. So there's an opportunity cost to having a gap in our schedules. Or we had to hire mid-level clinicians to see those patients according to protocols we wrote. But all of this worked really well. And we were able to take 29,000 patients through Come Home, and we were able to lower those costs, as I mentioned, and we were able to prove that we delivered better care. Because I knew that one of the questions we would get would be, did you just ration care and that's how you save money? So we got all the doctors together and we created pathways that were group decision support. What should we do? What would be the optimal therapy for a person with this type of cancer and this type of com complications from it and these other diseases? And we put those in a pathway. And then we could extract the data from the pathways and say whether or not we were compliant with evidence-based care. And I believe there's two parts of quality of care. One is actually knowing what to do and doing it well. 
And the other part is the customer service part of care. So do we know what we're doing and are we doing it well? We can measure by electronically extracting that data without making my doctors turn into data entry clerks. And doctors hate being data entry clerks. So that really worked very well. And the triage pathways, we could also measure the usage of those so that we could tell whether or not we were doing a good job on the customer service. My ultimate goal is to be able to pull the data from the, from the diagnosis and therapeutic pathways so I know what regimens we're using, combine that with the, tri with the triage activations so I know how toxic it was, and then be able to look at that entire episode and be able to measure the cost of the care that we're giving. That's true quality. Now, if this is the case, what is happening in this country when we're seeing that there are fewer and fewer independent practices? So this map is not one of those phone company maps. It is actually the number of independent oncology practices in the country who had closed or sold to a hospital in 2010. And here it is today. So we are in the verge of losing our low cost, high quality providers of healthcare service. There's a lot of data that shows that we are less expensive. It's about $6,000 per chemotherapy course than a hospital-based system. And how did this come about? Well, it started with a thing called the sustainable growth rate formula, which fortunately, April of 2015, we got rid of in a switch to MACRA. But since 2004 onward, physician practices have seen an actual decrease in their cost because it was held level while the expenses go up. But hospitals have been given about a 2.5 to 3.5% raise every year, called a market basket increase. So that scissor graph, you see, is what we refer to as the site of service differential. So if I'm providing a service down there today, it costs you one thing. If I sell to the hospital and provide a service on this hospital outpatient, the very next day, the very same service to the very same patient would cost you that much. Our country cannot afford that. We're on track to spend 18% of our gross domestic product on health care. That leaves very little for schools and roads and parks and the environment. We cannot continue this way. We are looking for a solution. What Come Home showed was that if you give doctors the tools that they need, the resources they need, a, the ability to hire the personnel to create a team of people who are all working together to take care of people, you can come up with a system that not only gives better health, better health care at a lower price, but makes doctors a lot happier and a lot willing to work a lot harder. This is not just oncology. It's symptom-based pathways. So anyone who's managing chronic disease that has acute exacerbations can use a system like this. They can use it to manage their patients, to keep them healthier, out of hospitals. I feel a sense of urgency looking at that previous map, because if we lose those independent practices, how are we ever going to afford to rebuild them? I feel that we have to change our course now, and we have to look at what we're doing in this country. We have to re-support the infrastructure of the small businesses that are in small communities and large communities across our country. We have to do it for the sake of the country, but I do it for Larry. Thank you.